today i'll be talking about uh, the radiological aspects of traumatic brain injury um, as you are all aware that traumatic brain injury is one of the uh, most common uh, clinical conditions encountered by a neurosurgeon or and uh, neurosurgery residents uh, and interns who are under training and uh, although uh, it is one of the earliest uh, things which they uh, get to learn in neurosurgery but still uh, it's always a good idea to revisit uh, the basics and to refresh uh, the knowledge. Uh, I uh, understand that there might be some uh, participants uh, who would be medical students uh, and uh, some mostly uh, they would be residents. So I'll try to also mention some basic aspects uh, which might be uh, too uh, basic for residents, but uh, I'll try to mention those so that uh, everyone uh, understands whatever aspects I teach. So uh, uh, my whole uh, presentation would be mostly interactive and it will be uh, apart from a couple of slides. Uh, you won't see any uh, texts in the slide. Uh, in the slides. Uh, there would be all scans and pictures and uh, because uh, an important uh, purpose of this session is to teach practical aspects and implications of uh, neuroradiology. Um, a theoretical uh, knowledge uh, everyone can acquire even while uh, sitting at their homes. So it's actually the practical aspects which one can uh, learn through these sessions. So the common causes of uh, traumatic uh, brain injury uh, are a fall of a patient from height, ground level fall of the patient, uh, fall of an object on a patient's head, road traffic accidents, assault with a blunt object or gunshot injury, uh, which are basically penetration injuries. So these are the common conditions and whenever a neurosurgery resident uh, or intern uh, receives a patient with a history, one of these histories, uh, he or she uh, immediately uh, thinks of a possible traumatic brain injury and then uh, has to decide whether an imaging is needed or not. So uh, two very basic principles of deciding whether to get an, uh, a brain imaging done or not include uh, whether uh, include uh, the assessing the patient's neurological status, if it's altered, or if there is a history of altered neurological status, uh, a brain imaging is warranted. And secondly, if the impact or the mode of trauma uh, is severe, uh, even without any neurological uh, deficits or impairment, uh, a brain imaging is warranted to rule out a traumatic brain injury. So these are the common, uh, this is a classification of traumatic brain injury. Uh, there is primary injury and secondary injury. And um, the role of a neurosurgery resident on call uh, who is covering ER uh, or a radiology resident uh, on call uh, covering ER is to uh, act as a detective uh, whenever, whether, uh, whenever a patient with uh, history of traumatic brain injury comes and gets imaging done. And these are the seven basic things or aspects which one has to search for in brain imaging. So some are primary injuries, which are visible uh, mostly right after uh, the traumatic event. These include fractures, contusions, uh, intracranial hematoma. This we'll see that there may be different types of it and diffuse axonal injury. And then a secondary injury which develops with time and uh, uh, over a course of further a uh, couple of days or three or four days after the traumatic event. And that includes edema, ischemia, and herniation. At times, uh, in case of uh, severe uh, traumatic impact or severe mode of injury, for example, a gunshot injury uh, to the head, it may result in uh, ischemia uh, as a primary injury because the bullet injures some blood vessel and causes ischemia. So at times, these secondary injuries can be present in, uh, at the time of initial presentation as well. But, mo but mostly... Uh, when we uh, receive a patient in ER, we search the scans for primary injuries. So uh, this is a CT scan machine and you all must uh, have seen this. And uh, for those who have not seen it, it basically comprises of this circular uh, area, which uh, is the area where uh, the X-rays are emitted. CT scan is basically based on uh, X-rays, whereas MRI is based on uh, magnetic waves. Uh, we have uh, we have had previous uh, lectures on uh, the basics of CT scans and MRI, and you all can refer to those uh, by visiting our YouTube channel and uh, listening to those lectures. So CT scan is basically the hallmark of uh, traumatic brain injury imaging. And uh, an important 
Uh, reason for that is it's readily available. It's not uh, that costly and uh, it can be done uh, quickly. Uh, so, uh, and not a lot of expertise is required to interpret it. Unlike MRI imaging, which is more costly, which uh, requires time to uh, be done. And then it also requires a certain degree of uh, expertise to uh, for interpretation. So most of our talk today would be based on uh, the application of CT scan for traumatic brain injury, and you would be uh, seeing a lot of scans. So uh, this is an axial section and this is a basic image and I just put it here to let everyone know, particularly if there are any medical students and the participants that uh, just like in MRI, uh, in CT scan as well, uh, the imaging is printed in such a way and presented in such a way that the area on the uh, which appears on the left is actually right side of the patient and the area which is on the left is actually the uh, which appears on the right is actually the left side so it's opposite this is the left side of the patient and this is the right side of the patient so orientation is very important uh, whenever uh, it depicts basic orientation uh, as i already mentioned that uh, whenever we tend to do something an important aspect in whatever we do uh, is to first uh, orient ourselves uh, with regards to uh, uh, what are the uh, particular aspects of that imaging. So whenever we see a CT scan, um, it's important to know uh, what sequence or what uh, how the slices of that CT scan were obtained. So these are the three different planes uh, which can be seen here uh, on this picture. The, this horizontal one in yellow is the axial plane and it appears like this. And uh, this pink colored one is the sagittal plane and it appears like this. It looks as if the uh, pictures or images are taken from side. And uh, this green uh, colored uh, plane is the coronal plane, which is over here. And it's basically the anterior posterior plane uh, where we uh, are looking from the front. So it's important to know this orientation because whenever we interpret or read CT scans or tell anyone, about the findings on a CT scan, uh, we have to mention on which uh, sequence or plane uh, those uh, findings were present. Now, whenever we acquire a CT scan, these are the three basic uh, type of images which can be obtained. The one on the left side is a scout radiograph, and it's basically an X-ray which shows that, uh, which is taken right at the beginning of uh, uh, the CT when the CT scan machine is starting to work and you can see these uh, dotted lines these dotted lines are basically the uh, planes of sections different sections uh, which later appear like this conventionally uh, each of these section uh, is at a distance of uh, 0 0.5 uh, centimeters or uh, 5 millimeters uh, we do have uh, thin uh, cuts or thin slices of uh, CT scan even uh, uh, at uh, 1 millimeter apart uh, but mostly for uh, traumatic brain injury imaging, uh, as a convention, uh, we have these uh, dot these uh, planes uh, 0.5 centimeter apart, and it's a there's a reason to know this uh, because uh, we'll see later on that uh, we can calculate at times you have to calculate the volume of uh, the pathology or hematoma, and uh, uh, an important aspect of calculating the volume is to know these uh, measurements. This uh, image over here, which is labeled as brain window. So this shows us uh, the brain parenchyma uh, more clearly. Uh, we can, and the ventricles as well. We can see this uh, hypodense or black colored uh, stru uh, uh, structure over here, which is the lateral ventricle, the frontal horn. Uh, this gray structure is the brain parenchyma. And this white structure is basically the uh, bone of the patient. So uh, it's important to know uh, that we use the terminologies of isodense, hypodense, and hyperdense uh, whenever we are reading a CT scan. And this density is uh, measured or mentioned with regards to the density of brain parenchyma. So if something appears darker as compared to brain parenchyma, uh, which is grayish, so we call it hypodense. And uh, the two common things which appear hypodense on a CT scan are fluid, and air. Uh, if something appears more brighter or whitish as compared to brain parenchyma, like we can see the bone over here, it is called hyperdense. Uh, this is important to know because acute blood also appears 
uh, hyperdense on a CT scan. Now this uh, image on the right hand side, this is the bone window. And you can see that if there is a fracture on brain window, it would be difficult to uh, identify because there is so much brightness around uh, the bone that that fracture line would be missed. However, this uh, bone window basically uh, lightens up uh, the contrast so that the bone appears uh, more prominent. And we can see whenever we have to uh, mention or talk about a fracture, a cerebral, uh, a skull fracture, we can never uh, tell or mention skull fracture on a brain window unless there is a loss of bone and um, it's very clearly visible. But otherwise, we always ask or uh, mention that we require bone window to mention the uh, fractures. So I've already mentioned about the scout radiograph. Now this is, uh, I just uh, put up this image so that uh, you can see that how an MRI machine appears different uh, from a CT scanner. And you can see that it's a bigger machine, the, uh, this structure over here, this big structure in which there is a opening in the middle where the patient's, uh, patient uh, slides inside. This is the main MRI machine where magnetic waves are emitted. And uh, so the role of uh, MRI in traumatic brain injury is very limited and it mainly concerns with regards to secondary uh, brain injury. Uh, primary brain injury often can, uh, cannot be picked up on an MRI imaging, uh, but secondary injuries like ischemia uh, or uh, herniation uh, that can be picked up on MRI. Among the primary brain injuries, a diffuse axonal injury are uh, one condition for which um, most often, uh, we have a normal appearing CT scan and an MRI uh, shows small punctured uh, hemorrhages uh, in the cortex or in the corpus callosum, uh, depicting a diffuse axonal injury. So the role of MRI is very limited. And in our talk today, we'll uh, touch it very briefly uh, towards the end. Most of the talk will be based on CT scan images. So before uh, starting or moving on to the pathologies, I have put up this uh, uh, picture over here. On the left-hand side, you can see how a CT scan image appears. And on the right-hand side, you can see how an MRI uh, image appears, different sections and different uh, sequences. I put it up just uh, for the purpose of uh, learning because uh, for beginners or for medical students, uh, quite a lot of times, it's even, uh, it even gets difficult to differentiate whether the scan is a CT scan or an MRI. So it's important to uh, see and identify whether the imaging provided to you is a CT scan or an MRI. And it just comes with time uh, by seeing more and more scans that uh, you get oriented with it. So you all can uh, always, uh, I would not go into details of uh, different sequences of MRI uh, that was covered in an earlier talk and uh, you all can watch it on our YouTube channel. So just like in CT scan, we have a similar axial, sagittal and coronal planes on an MRI. Okay, so now we move on to the clinical uh, aspect and clinical findings. Um, an important uh, aspect which we want to see or identify on a brain CT scan in a patient with traumatic brain injury is to see one whether there is any abnormality or not and if that if there is an abnormality does it require surgical intervention or it can be conservatively managed so the most uh, important aspects which you all should know is that whenever uh, there is uh, even a uh, beginning of brain herniation on a brain CT scan or a head uh, on a head CT scan, uh, we should get vigilant, and uh, that patient is a critical patient which uh, who may require a surgical intervention. This uh, graphical picture over here shows different types of brain herniations, and brain herniation. Um, I'll I'll just briefly mention about the Monroe Kelly doctrine, uh, which we all uh, read in our uh, medical school, uh, which mentions that skull is a closed cavity and it contains three uh, substances, parenchyma, CSF and blood. And whenever one of them increases, the other ones try to compensate or they try to decrease in uh, volume. So there comes a time when there is not enough space available uh, for the brain to compensate. And uh, that is the point when brain herniation starts. Now brain herniation can be within the cranial vault or it can be outside the cranial vault. We can see here, this is called transcalvarial uh, herniation. There is a defect in the bone and uh, 
you can see this uh, biconvex red structure, which is the extradural hematoma. And this trans, uh, it is causing mass effect. It is pushing the brain and opposite, uh, at the opposite end, there was a defect in the bone and brain got uh, space to move out from there. So this is called transcalvarial uh, herniation. It is often seen in penetrating injuries uh, or injuries where there is a significant loss of uh, bone as a result of trauma. Now, uh, you can see over here, uh, this is the Fox cerebri. And uh, whenever there is a midline shift present on a CT scan, that is because the brain parenchyma is pushed beneath the Fox towards the opposite side. So this is called subthalsine herniation. Then at times there is, uh, over here you can see, this is the uncus, which is at the medial aspect of temporal bone. And this black structure over here, this is our tentorium uh, cerebelli. And because of the mass effect, this uncus is pushed down in between the brain stem and the tentorium. And this is called uncle herniation. Whenever uncle herniation happens, uh, oculomotor nerve is also passing through this side and it gets compressed and the patient develops uh, ipsilateral pupillary dilation. Then there is upward herniation, which we can see if there is swelling or edema in the cerebellum. Just like when there is supratentorial uh, mass effect, uncus is pushed downwards. Similarly, if there is cerebellar uh, edema or cerebellar mass effect, the cerebellum or brainstem is pushed upwards across the tentoria. Uh, central or transtentorial herniation usually occurs when there is gross cerebral edema and uh, there is no space for brain even for subfilsine herniation or uncle herniation because the pathology is uh, widespread. It's uh, and they are on both sides and then the brain parenchyma is pushed downwards. And we can see that this is the form and magnum and cerebellar tonsils are then uh, pushed downwards. So these are the different types of herniation and we'll see these in subsequent images. So uh, an important thing which all of you should know is that uh, uh, what are the important structures which we need to identify whenever, whenever we are seeing a CT scan of a patient with traumatic brain injury. So first of all, we have to look at the brain parenchyma, whether there are abnormalities or not. And more importantly, we also need to know whether there is any herniation taking place or not. So any type of these herniations, whether they are taking place or not, that is our task and we always try to uh, look for that. So we can, uh, to know that or identify that, we need to know some uh, spaces around the uh, brain parenchyma, where, which are filled with CSF and are called cisterns. These are the spaces uh, where, uh, in case of a mass effect, the CSF gets, uh, the volume of CSF reduces and the space obliterates. And uh, if these spaces reduce in size, uh, that means that uh, the patient has impending herniation or has herniated. So these spaces are mainly around the brainstem. You can see this smiling face. This is just posterior to the midbrain. And uh, this is called the quadrigeminal cistern. So this, if this smiling face is present, you would know that there, basal, one of the basal cisterns is patent. Then just as you go a little down, this cistern extends more anteriorly around the, uh, this is the junction of brainstem and uh, of midbrain and pons. And this black line and this black line, which is slightly obliterated because this is the scan of a patient who had a traumatic brain injury and there is some edema in the bilateral temporal lobes. So you can see the quadrigeminal cistern is quite wide and quite prominent, but these cisterns where I am moving my pointer and these, these are called the ambient cistern. These are not that prominent. So we can say that uh, the size of ambient cisterns is being reduced. And over here, we can even not identify ambient cistern at all. So this would mean that we can, we would call that effacement of the cistern. And uh, this is the place where this is the medial aspect of temporal lobe. And if uncle herniation is taking place, uh, this cistern would get effaced. As we go further down, uh, we would see that yes, so this is pons, and just anterior to pons is the prepontine system, and this is also wide open. So these are the common important basal systems we which we need to know 
the P pontine cistern, the ambient cistern, and the quadrigeminal cistern. Okay, on a sagittal section. Okay, so this is the uh, cisterna magna through which if there is tonsillar herniation, this cistern would get obliterated. On a sagittal section, uh, uh, the place where I have my pointer, this is the quadrigeminal cistern and this is the prepontine cistern. The ambient cisterns are lateral uh, to the pons on either side. So if we see that this cisterna magna is patent, we can see hypodense CSF over here. There is no tonsillar herniation in this patient. We can see the prepontine cistern and the uh, quadrigeminal cistern uh, very prominent. So there is no central herniation as well. And then uh, no uncle herniation, most likely, if uh, we can see on this image on a coronal section. This point where I have my pointer, this is the uncus. And we can see this is the brainstem. If there is uncle herniation, this space gets obliterated. In this particular patient, although there is edema around here, it is a post-traumatic case, but still uh, there is no significant herniation present in this patient. Uh, we can see some subarachnoid hemorrhage over here. We would also see it later in other subsequent scans. So once we identify all these cisterns and we see that there is no midline shift in the scan, our tendency is to uh, move more towards conservative management of that patient. But in case these cisterns are being obliterated or effaced, that means that the patient requires uh, surgical intervention um, or maximum uh, medical intervention to reduce uh, the severity. Okay, so I'll just initially identify common uh, pathologies, common intracranial hematomas. Uh, so I'll ask uh, one of our residents, uh, Dr. Mustafa, to just uh, read uh, this scan and uh, tell us what are the uh, main important findings. Just uh, tell the what type of scan this is and what is the main finding. Um, hello, thank you, Dr. Saki. So we are seeing the axial cut or CD scan brain plane. Uh, here we could see the right uh, parietal uh, line shaped hyperdense lesion. Uh, which is well circumscribed and causing significant mass effect and metal line shift. And there's also a cerebral edema at right hemisphere. And we can see that, uh, uh, so sulci are obliterated on the right side as well. And there's also subgalial hematome collection on the right bilaterally. And uh, here we can see, comment of the, uh, we can't comment on the bone. Uh, we better appreciate it in the bone window, whether it's a fracture or not. Right. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. So we can see that whenever there is a biconvex uh, structure, uh, it's most likely an extradural uh, structure. And uh, if you compare this density with the density of brain, it's more brighter. It's not as bright as bone, but it's brighter than brain brain. brain. So it's most likely acute blood. And... Uh, uh, a biconvex appearing acute blood is a uh, is an extra dual hematoma. An important thing uh, which you all should know is that uh, since uh, the uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, rightly mentioned that this is uh, mainly in the parietal uh, area of the brain, but it's not just in the parietal; uh, it's also pushing, uh, extending towards the frontal, and maybe its lower end might be extending towards the temporal lobe as well. So it's important to mention that it's at the convexity on the right side and mainly posterior convexity. So that would uh, save you the trouble of uh, committing yourself, whether it's only in the frontal area or the parietal area. So it's important to just mention an right-sided convexity, uh, posterior extradural hematoma. So, uh, okay. And you can see that the, there is midline shift over here. This is the Fox cerebri and then uh, the brain is pushed towards the opposite side, as we saw in that graphical picture. So there is sub sign herniation as well uh, present in this patient. This black structure over here, I mentioned initially that uh, there are a couple of things which appear darker than the brain parent gyma on a CT scan. One is fluid, which is seen here, and the other one is air, which is seen in the uh, over here in the frontal sinuses. So air appears uh, uh, bright black, 
uh, on a CT scan, just like bone is appearing bright white on a CT scan. Now, in case some air speck is present over here, uh, okay, I think I'll, I'll mention that in a subsequent scan later on, where we'll have a pneumocephalus to differentiate. I want all of you to know how to differentiate between blood and uh, calcification. Like we can see this white dot over here and this. So is this uh, hematoma or is this calcification? Uh, Dr. Mustafa, can you comment on this? This white dot over here. Uh, it's a calcification. Uh, right. So is there a way? Uh, I'm sure that you are, you are rightly saying that it's a calcification based on your experience of uh, reading a number of uh, CT scans earlier. But is there a way to confirm whether it's calcification or a small punctate uh, hemorrhage? So, yes, uh, we can do on the basis of Hansfield unit. Uh, we right. need to compare it to the blood. Right. Uh, good. So uh, <clears throat> there uh, we can always quantify the density of uh, the different structures we see on a CT scan in the, in the form of units. And those are called Hounsfield units. Uh, they can be, they cannot be calculated on a printed film, but uh, most of the radiology softwares at hospitals have the uh, feature of calculating Hounsfield units. And we can always see that bone uh, has a, a uh, Hounsfield units of more than 100 and blood has Hounsfield units of less than 100, usually in the range of 50 to 60. Air has a Hounsfield units of uh, minus 1,000, and fluid has uh, is positive, uh, has a positive uh, Hounsfield unit. So it's always uh, uh, important to know how to confirm uh, your findings. Okay, so uh, this is another CT head. Uh, Dr. Ahmer, uh, can you uh, mention the findings? Dr. Ahmer is also one of our residents. Some of uh, so on the CT scan, this is an axial image of uh, CT and we can appreciate that uh, there is um, hyperdensity on the right frontotemporal uh, region, which is extending up to the parietal region. And uh, this is causing uh, some midline shift in mass effect uh, to the contralateral side. Apart from it, I do not appreciate any confusions over here. However, there is a questionable uh, some sub um, galial hematoma as well, but uh, I need to see more cuts to say. Uh, so, based on these findings, I would say this is a uh, acute subdural. Okay, good. Uh, yes. Uh, so, this is an acute subdural hematoma. You can see that it's this is crescent shaped. It's concavo convex, and uh, it's extending right from the anterior to the posterior aspect of the uh, brain. Usually extradural hematomas are limited by dural attachments to the bone. Uh, usually uh, dura is attached to bone at different places, mostly at places where there are uh, fused uh, suture lines. So extradural hematoma would rarely extend from anterior to the posterior aspect. It, it would be limited by different suture lines. Whereas the subdural hematoma, on the other hand, uh, extends can extend right from anterior to the posterior. And uh, Dr. Fatma, can you uh, just tell uh, quickly uh, if we compare a subdural hematoma or to an extradural hematoma, which one of them uh, can cause more debilitating brain injury and more edema in the brain? Which one of these? Extradural hematoma or subdural hematoma? So we know that more, both of them cause mass effect. hematoma. More, right. more force is required subdural hematoma as compared to extradural hematoma, and there is right. So a subdural hematoma is basically present in the subdural uh, space. It's right next to the brain. Uh, there's the pyometer in between, and therefore it causes a more uh, inflammatory reaction in the brain parenchyma as compared to an extra dural hematoma which is present outside the dura and the dura acts as a barrier uh, between brain and extra dural. Extra dural hematomas on the other hand can rapidly increase in volume and result in sudden death of the patient because they can cause rapid herniation. Subdural hematomas on the other hand slowly progress and uh, their mass effect 
in the form of edema also slowly progresses uh, but overall uh, the outcomes of subdural hematoma if the patient survives uh, are uh, bad as compared to uh, an extradural hematoma extradural hematoma if taken out timely has excellent outcomes okay so uh, if dr adnan uh, can uh, read this uh, ct scan image it has uh, multiple findings it's an axial section of a ct head so this uh, ct brain plane uh, ct brain axial section shows diffuse cerebral edema uh, as well as subarachnoid hemorrhage bilateral pronounced in this uh, sylvan fissures. It also shows uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, most prominent in the posterior horns, as well as some ventricular mechanism. Right. So, uh, so there are multiple findings on this. Uh, you did not mention about uh, this white structure over here. It's basically in the lateral ventricles, and this is uh, uh, the place uh, where uh, the lateral ventricles drain into the third ventricle via the foramen of Monro. And most likely this patient had a tube and extraventricular drain uh, placed over here uh, for relieving hydrocephalus. But uh, just on, if you see this CT scan image, we would mention that this likely appears a foreign body. Uh, we would like to see other images as well, other sections as well to be sure whether it's a, a, a VP shunt or any VD drain. You all can should appreciate this fluid level over here. This is blood and this is CSF. And uh, this is blood in the ventricle. And now you can see this white structure. It appears more brighter. And this is calcification. This whiter structure, this is blood. Now there is very uh, marginal difference in the density of both of these. So someone who is a junior resident or an intern might just think well, that this may also be blood. And this may also be blood, and this may also be blood. So it's always important to know that you can confirm it by measuring the uh, Hounsfield units. This is this white structure are uh, age-related uh, calcification in the choroid plexus, and these are present in the lateral ventricles. You can see these are uh, white lines in between. So these are basically sulci, and this is the uh, sylvian fissure over here. This is the sylvian fissure over here. We can see gross uh, subarachnoid. Uh, hemorrhage bilateral now these are the kind of patients where we see send we can see central brain herniation because there are pathologies on both sides of the brain edema on both sides and uh, this can cause central herniation downwards plus you can appreciate this ebd drain was likely inserted because there was hydrocephalus over here because of uh, obstruction to the csf flow okay so <clears throat> You all can see this is also an axial section of a CT scan and we can see small white dot uh, dots, different dots over here. And uh, these are cerebral contusions. Now, cerebral contusions are not as bright as an intracranial hematoma uh, because these contusions are basically bruising of the brain. We'll see uh, a brain image later on as well today in the presentation, how a contused brain would appear. But just as you or most of you would have uh, experienced or seen bruising on the arms or uh, legs, uh, like it appears bluish and reddish. So this is bruising of, in simpler words, this is bruising of the brain parenchyma. And these are multiple cerebral contusions. The hypodensity is around these contusions, that is cerebral edema. And you can see over here, we can appreciate the cilium fissure, but over here it's all obliterated because of the significant edema and mass effect. Plus, you also cannot see any cisterns over here, even the third ventricle. Uh, there wouldn't be any cisterns here, but the third ventricle appears to be quite compressed uh, in this section because of the mass effect. Okay, so uh, after the uh, intraparenchymal injuries, uh, uh, Dr. Nasser, if he's present, can he uh, identify the findings on both these? These are bone windows. This is the axial section, and this is the sagittal section. Dr. Nasser is also one of our residents. And uh, if he's present, can he explain these findings? And uh, 
uh, if he's uh, not present, then maybe Dr. Fatma can uh, describe these. Um, So uh, we cannot hear you, Fatma. Uh, just because of the paucity of time, I would uh, 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 describe these scans myself. We can see that there is discontinuity in the uh, bone over here. These are fractures, and uh, these would not be that uh, visible on a bone on a brain uh, window. But over here, we can see this is the place where we had frontal sinuses. If I move on to the earlier image over here. These are the frontal sinuses. And if there is a fracture line in over here, that wouldn't be visible. So these are frontal fractures, which are involving both the outer table and the inner table of the uh, frontal sinus. And these black dots over here, these are air specs. So this is a sagittal section. And over here, we can also see that there are multiple fractures on the outer and the inner table of the bone. And there are the fractures extending towards the skull base as well multiple air specs over here. This is the uh, cella over here. So it's important to identify these injuries because if a patient has this kind of a fracture, then uh, there is a higher chance that there was dural tear over here and there might be CSF leak later on. So it's important to identify these findings and to decide whether an urgent or emergent surgical intervention is needed or not. We'll see some, some other uh, fractures as well. Okay, so this is a depressed skull fracture, and uh, this is a bone window, but uh, the bone appears more brighter over here. Not exactly a bone window, and uh, we can see that uh, there is a fracture, and the fracture segment are pushed inside. So this is important to know whenever uh, the depression of the bone uh, or uh, the depressed part of the bone is equal to or more than the thickness of the brain parenchyma then uh, that is an indication for uh, elevation of that fracture because then that signifies significant cerebral uh, compression at that side. So if there was just a small uh, push of this fracture uh, bone inside, then that might uh, uh, have been uh, managed conservatively, but this was uh, definitely managed uh, surgically. This. Okay. So, uh, if Dr. Mustafa is uh, present, can he uh, identify the finding? This is a typical fracture. This is a pediatric scan, uh, CT scan, because we can see the frontal, uh, the anterior fontanelle is open over here. So, this is a child which had a history of fall. Uh, so uh, we cannot hear Dr. Mustafa properly. I will just uh, quickly describe that. Uh, we can see quite often uh, the bone over here is not clearly fractured. It's basically compressed. And there, might, there would be definitely some cracks over here, just like green stick fractures appear in the limbs. But uh, it's just compressed inside. And since the anterior fontanelle is open, this would not be causing a uh, significant compression of the brain. And as the child's brain grows, uh, this bone grows and the fractured bone, the compressed bone is pushed outside as well. So these fractures are typically called ping pong fractures. And uh, I'm sure most of you would have seen a ping pong ball. This is a 3D scan. And you can see these small thin lines over here. These would be small fracture lines and thin fracture lines. And as the child would grow, this uh, compression would uh, be pushed outside. This is a ping pong ball. And uh, so these fractures are classically called uh, ping pong fractures. Okay, so uh, this is an important scan. This is a, a post-traumatic uh, imaging done in a patient with a significant road traffic accident. And uh, we cannot appreciate uh, uh, a lot of parenchymal injury, but we can see a lot of air specs. So this patient most likely had significant skull base fractures as seen on this bone window. And uh, there was uh, 
connection between the skull base uh, and the intracranial cavity, um, the outside, the nasal cavity and the intracranial cavity. And because of that, some significant amount of air is seen. And this air is also causing almost similar amount of a mass effect as a hematoma would cause. And I put up this scan over here because uh, whenever we see uh, this typical uh, picture or appearance, when uh, there is air anterior to bilateral uh, frontal lobes and extending in the middle as well towards the pots, uh, we call it a Mount Fuji sign. And uh, this signifies that the patient may have, may or may have or may be in uh, at the verge of developing tension pneumocephalus. At times, this air, if it's causing significant mass effect and the patient is neurologically impaired, this also warrants surgical intervention. Okay, so this is a patient who had uh, bilateral subdural hematoma, as you can see, anterior to posterior, anterior to posterior, we can see concave or convex findings. I put up this scan to let all of you know that in elderly uh, patients uh, who have multiple ground level falls, uh, they have uh, multiple episodes of subdural hematoma. And because of the shrinkage of the brain, the involutional changes in the brain, they, those subdural hematomas do not always cause significant mass effect. And uh, so they all mostly go unnoticed. But only when there is significant acute component uh, that those patients present to us in ER. So this patient likely had an old uh, subdural hematoma as well. As we can see anteriorly, this uh, mostly uh, isodense findings. These are subacute uh, findings. So if the hematoma is appearing isodense to the brain or slightly hypodense, this is slightly hypodense. Uh, hypodense is... Uh, moving towards chronic hemorrhage, isodense is more subacute, and hyperdense is acute hematoma. So this patient has a, had an acute on chronic subdural hematoma bilaterally. We'll also see a, a subacute one as well. Okay, so moving on, uh, uh, Fatma, uh, if you are back with us, can you describe these images? I can uh, appreciate that there are uh, multiple hyperdense um, uh, lesion in the uh, brain, mostly in the center of the brain. And as it appears from it, it appears that uh, there is a sharp nail or uh, bullet injury to this patient. And these are multiple. Right. So this patient had a gunshot injury. And uh, we can see multiple foreign bodies which appear very bright with some artifacts as well. These lines which appear, they are because of the uh, metal uh, present in, uh, in the intracranial uh, cavity. So we can see the prepontine cistern and the ambient cistern, they are patent. But as we go up towards the corpus, towards the third ventricle, thalamus and the corpus callosum, we can see significant injury. And these hypodensities, these are basically um, quite hypodense and these are likely infarcts uh, resulting because of vascular injury in the middle. And uh, we can see this is the entry wound of the patient. The bullet or the sharp nails are in the intracranial cavity. And uh, this patient would most likely uh, had, uh, have a, an injury to the superior sagittal sinus as well. So it's important to identify which important structures uh, could have been damaged or injured as a result of trauma. We can also appreciate these hypodense uh, changes in the ventricles. This would uh, mean intraventricular hematoma. So because of paucity of time, we would slightly move quickly. This, these are the scans of same patient. Now I put this image over here. Uh, we saw earlier that the brain might be herniating outside the cranial cavity. And over here, we can see because of significant cerebral edema, the brain parenchyma is coming out from the uh, fractured bone. And this is uh, extra cross calvarial herniation. These are the 3D images. This is 3D image of the same patient. This is another patient with a significant uh, gunshot injury. Entry wound is in the posterior fossa. 
and then the bone, uh, the bullet moved upwards towards the temporal lobe. So, uh, Dr. Ahmer, if uh, can you just uh, let us know which important vascular structure uh, would likely have been damaged as a result of this um, bullet injury? So, uh, if Dr. Emmer is not present over here, I'll just. Uh, uh, Dr. Sakit? Yes. Uh, you want to know the which structure would be uh, injured because of vascular structure? Vas important so, vascular structure. So, branches of the MCA would be injured in this. Uh, apart from that, the transfer sinus would also be injured. Right. So, those are the two vascular structures. Right. So, not just, not just the transfer sinus, the sigmoid sinus uh, might also have been injured in this case. And then. Uh, we can see this space. This is the area where there would be ICA bifurcation. So this patient might have injury to uh, MCA or ACA or ICA as well, or to the cavernous sinus as well, because because of the significant artifacts, we cannot clearly see uh, the extent of the uh, bullet. But this patient might have uh, injuries to all these vascular structures. So I just at times. For instance, in this particular case, the previous uh, scan, which you all saw, this patient has an, had an MCA. If we assume that this patient had an injury to MCA, a subsequent CT scan done after at least 12 to 24 hours would have shown this hypodense structure over here. And this is MCA territory in fact. So this is a secondary injury, which we should all be able to identify as well on uh, CT scans done after trauma. Okay, so this is hypodense structure right at the near the vertex as compared to the brain parenchyma on the right side. So this is also a subdural hematoma. And at times it's important to differentiate that you can all you also should appreciate this boundary in between the brain parenchyma and the hypodensity. This is quite uniform and sharp. So this would not be an infarct, this would be a chronic subdural hematoma. So if there would have been an injury to ICA in that case, uh, on the that was on the uh, right hand side, but if it had been on the left hand side, we can see this is global infarct on the left side. Uh, we can see the infarct on, uh, and uh, this was a patient uh, whose scan was done roughly 24 to 48 hours after initial presentation. All the ACA, MC, and PCA territory. Uh, have been involved. Okay, so over here we can see we can all you should you all would be appreciating significant mass effect. There is subphilocyte herniation. If you they noticed there is some hypodensity over here. Isodense, not hypodense, isodensity over here, which is over here. You can also appreciate slight membrane. So at times subacute subdural hematomas are difficult to identify and uh, one has to look very sharply uh, to notice. Uh, so this patient had a uh, subacute uh, subdural hematoma. So this again is an extradural hematoma. As I mentioned earlier when Dr. Mustafa described that uh, this is also uh, towards the convexity but it's in the more anterior area. So we can say that it's an anterior uh, extraterrestrial hematoma. Right. So if you see this hyperdensity, it's more brighter and more uh, uniform uh, and more homogeneous as compared to the earlier uh, hyperdensities, uh, hyperdensities which we saw over here. So these dotted small, small white dots, these are Contusions and these are not homogeneous. You can see hypodense edema around these as well. With contrast to this, if you see over here, this is more homogeneous. So this is uh, an ICH, an intracranial hematoma or intraparenchymal hematoma. We can also see that it's there's intraventricular extension as well and significant mass effect. Right. This is another example of a subdural hematoma. And there may be some 
सब एक नॉइट हैं बजे इस वेल राइट सो दिस वाज अ पेशेंट वेट प्रेजेंटेड विद अ रोड ट्रैफिक एक्सीडेंट एंड वी कैन सी देर वाज सिग्निफिकेंट लेफ्ट साइडेड ICH right sided subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, subfill cell herniation he had uncal herniation as well and the left side uh, pupil was dilated so he was taken to OR and a decompressive craniectomy was done and this uh, part of the bone uh, of the brain parenchyma it doesn't appear contused over here but intraoperatively it was it appeared slightly contused so you can see this is how a bruised uh, brain would appear there is some uh, quite a lot of hyperemia over here as well because of the uh, hematoma there was hematoma inside as well and then there are multiple contusions over here as well and you can see that we have this is the post op scan the volume of hematoma has also reduced the midline shift which was there on this scan this has significantly reduced and you see whenever we perform a, a decompressive craniectomy we are basically allowing transcalvarial herniation of the brain to happen but we make the opening in such a way that the brain does not get lacerated uh, or damaged and there is significant herniation of the brain outside so that uh, the intracranial vascular structures are not compressed and secondary brain injury is prevented so So see this; these are also again contusions, and now you can see that there would be some fractures over here as well. But still, uh, we would always ask for uh, bone windows as well of the CT scan uh, to clearly uh, tell whether and what what are the extents of fractures. Again, now I have put this image because at times it gets difficult to. differentiate whether it's a subdural hematoma or an extradural hematoma uh, i would call it an extradural hematoma because of two reasons one we can see that it's extending it's ending over here and we have the suture line over here so it's extending from one suture line to the other and secondly we can see an air spec extradural hematomas are quite often uh, or almost always associated with uh, uh, associated fracture as well No, no. So oh, that, that. Uh, most likely this is an extradural hematoma. So as I move towards the end of uh, this talk, uh, I would like to touch upon two concepts. One is the uh, blossoming of or worsening of cerebral contusions. This was a patient who had presented with a uh, significant traumatic brain injury and altered GCS, and this was the scan which was done at the time of presentation. now this ct scan shows does show obliteration or effacement of the sulci and there is some hyper density over here and some edema over here but otherwise there no there is no clear uh, patho very clear pathology visible now uh, patient's conscious level was not good so he was admitted for neuro observation hyperosmolar therapy was started and 24 hours later another scan was done and you can see this small contusion has progressed or uh, matured into this so a lot of times an initial scan done within 12 hours of the traumatic event does not clearly show uh, the extent of injury and if the conscious level of the patient does not directly correlate with the scan findings it's always a wise uh, decision to get the scan repeated uh, 12 to 24 hours after initial presentation so that any injuries that might have been uh, not have been visible earlier would become um, so i think this is the last uh, slide of this talk and uh, uh, i just uh, these are mri sections this is t2 weighted image now this patient had presented with altered gcs after a traumatic uh, event and uh, we cannot see or appreciate the ct scan did not show any significant hematomas or significant cerebral edema the patient was admitted and uh, because of low gcs hyperosmolar therapy was started and uh, hyperosmolar therapy was not started in this case but he was admitted and he was intubated because of low gcs a tracheostomy was done later on in icu uh, because the gcs was less than 8 uh, Uh, and the patient could not be extubated and mri was done later on and you can see on t2 weighted image uh, there are small 
hyper intense dots over here and over here, but not very clear. T1 weighted uh, axial section does not clearly show any pathology, but on flare coronal section, we can see these small uh, hyper intense dots in the white matter over here, over here, over here. Not very clear, but this is a, a susceptibility weighted image, which shows us uh, hemosiderin deposits. And over here we can see these all black dots. So these are all small punctate hemorrhages. Uh, this is towards the cortex, and these are uh, around the in the anterior uh, corpus callosum, in the uh, towards the uh, basal ganglia. So uh, these depict diffuse axonal injury. Uh, in younger patients, these have good prognosis, and uh, it's difficult to identify these even on a normal uh, conventional MRI. Uh, luckily, we had a susceptibility weighted image available and we could appreciate these uh, injuries um, and uh, which depict a fuse exam. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So I think I finished uh, just in time and uh, I hope all of you uh, had a good time and uh, uh, this talk would have uh, definitely helped you uh, revise your uh, concepts or refresh your memory about the basic concepts of traumatic brain injuries, uh, radiological aspects.